Hello everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, David. Good morning. All right, Reggie. <clears throat> Feel free to share your webcams and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join this morning. I think it's going to be a great session. And um, let's see, we got David Jacobs, I think, online. Dave from St. Petersburg, our newest agent. Welcome, Dave. Uh, we have Jim, Reggie, Hilton. Got uh, Rich in St. Saint... Uh, no, we've got Rich from Canada, Richard Burrio. He's on a trip to uh, Toronto right now. All right, I'm going to record the session and uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you like, you can turn on your webcams and everyone else can see you too. Um, makes it more of a virtual um, type meeting. Oh, and there is uh, David. How are you doing, David, this morning? I hope you weren't assaulted by any uh, crazy people. You were? I had it insulted and uh, difficult. Oh, wow. They, the, they want to strip the house completely. If we dropped the price 10%, now she wants to strip the house of everything, including the stove and the refrigerator. <laughs> oh. She told, get my car, she told me to get my car out of the driveway. <laughs> Oh God! The adventures of being a real estate professional. I give, I give. It, it dropped the price ten percent, so but nobody goes up to this location. It's very difficult. Mm. I'm gonna have to sell it online oh, through Zillow and work. <clears throat> but uh, I'll give it to the end of March, and then I'm gonna bail out. I I hear you. I hear you. All right, we got uh, uh, several other people online. Uh, I don't think anyone else has their webcam up and running though. Unless Do something. Thomas, can you hear me? This is Jim. Hey, Jim. Oh, uh, there's Dave. I've got everything turned on, but the uh, it says at the top, waiting to view Thomas's screen, and it's taken up most of it. And well, I'm not sharing my screen. Turn it on, but it, is it working? I'm can not sharing. Me? I'm not sharing my screen. Um, I can. Oh, see, okay. I can see David and Dave, and uh, can you see me? I cannot see yeah. you. No. Okay, I got the webcam on. Get the camera button on the top. Oh, are you coming calling from your cell phone or your laptop? Or your laptop desktop? I'm on the laptop. Yeah, I've I, done this many times, but for some reason it's not working right today. I'm going to send you a webcam request. How about that? Let me see. Here we go. The wonders of technology, but anyhow. Um, okay. I'm Dave, I can hear. Dave, as the uh, as the new guy on the team, um, we're having these uh, meetings uh, every Monday morning from uh, nine to ten o'clock, and uh, we used to do them in the office every week, and um, only two or three people showed up, and everyone else went online. So we decided that we're going to have an in office meeting on the first Monday of each month, and then the rest of the time we're um, we're online here. And um, I try to record these sessions, so if, if you you know can't attend, you'll be able to uh, to log in uh, later. Well, let's. Uh, any questions from anyone before we get started? Don't hurt yourself, Jim. Trying to uh, set up your webcam. Oh, we got uh, Rick from St. Pete joining us. I mean, it's either click on or. I clicked on it. If I click on the webcam, it blanks out everything and it gives me a just a welcome screen. So I'm just going to leave it the way it is. I can hear you fine. All right. Well, we're going to switch to uh, screen sharing here in a second anyways. Um, <clears throat> so today I want to talk about uh, contracts. Who thinks that they are 100% uh, confident and proficient that uh, when it comes to contracts? Just perfect. No one? 
darn, I was looking for someone that I can team up with the new agents to help them. <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry, I missed it. <clears throat> who, who is 1,000% proficient with contracts? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty firm on my contracts as is, that's there, but uh, one of the issues that came up this weekend is that the, you know, when they signed our contract, it said uh, solid pays for title. Now she, now, now she says she's not paying for anything, you know, and she's not going to pay our fee. You know, blah 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 blah. So in terms of putting my foot down, it's a contractual obligation. Yep. Uh, that kind of thing is, is not going to come up. You know what? I won't worry about that. If, if if you have a signed contract with the seller, as in the listing agreement, and uh, we're not talking about listing agreements today, but just uh, generally speaking. If we have an executed contract and they decide to change their mind later and they, you know, want to pay you less commissions or whatever it is, um, you know, I personally wouldn't agree to it and I, would, I wouldn't make an issue of it either. Let's wait until the property is under contract and we'll deal with it at the closing table, um, you know, so. But I want to talk about for sale contracts and um, <clears throat> Before I go to the screen share, we look at the actual documents. I want to make sure I'm, I'm a big stickler, first of all, when it comes to terminology. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Ricky, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, a lot of agents uh, use the term contract when it really isn't a contract, okay? Um, so I want to just go through the process and, you know, feel free to take notes. But uh, when, when you're working with a buyer, let's say, for example, and the buyer wants to buy a property and uh, you're writing out an offer, it's not a contract, it's an offer, okay? So the, the three things to kind of ingrain is, number one, um, the document that is pre-printed that says as-is contract, for example, is just a piece of paper, it's nothing. Um, when you fill that out and the buyer signs off on it, um, you now have an offer. And that offer does not become a contract until everyone has agreed on every single thing and the last person touched the thing and initialed off on a change. Until that point, it just remains an offer. And um, so when you send the offer to the uh, listing agent and the seller and the seller responds back, and let's say they sign everything and initial everything, but there's one thing that they missed or one box that they unchecked and checked a different box instead, well, that now makes it a counter offer. It's no longer, uh, it's still not a contract, you know. Now when the buyer goes ahead and accepts those changes, then you have a contract, but if the buyer changes something back, it's a counter offer. And um, a couple of things to understand, and I've seen many agents have uh, painful experiences with that, is that either party, the party making the offer initially or the party making the counter offer back, uh, can rescind that offer up until the point that it has been accepted by the, by the other party. So um, let's say you make an offer uh, to the seller and then there are some changes and you and the seller, you agree on everything, the seller counters back, you, know, you change the purchase price, whatever, and they send it back to you and you send it on to your buyer and uh, and then you get an email from the seller letting you know that this uh, from the listing agent letting you know that the seller is rescinding the offer um, well if the buyer hasn't accepted that offer yet and communicated that acceptance through you to the listing agent then that's perfectly legal you know um, so likewise the buyer the buyer makes an offer and the seller hasn't accepted it yet the buyer can rescind that offer at any given time. And, uh, and, and most agents don't understand that. And the reason I'm stressing that point is that um, you want to be very detail oriented and not sloppy when it comes to making your offers. A lot of agents um, have take this attitude of, oh, you know what, that's not a problem, we'll fix that later or we'll add that later when they write up their offers. You know, let's say a disclosure is missing you don't have a condo writer on a condominium offer, you don't have the seller's property disclosure on, a, on an initial offer, and you submit that offer, and the agent's attitude is, well, you know, we'll get around to that, you know, they can respond to it when they, when they, send, when they accept the terms, they can send that document back. Not understanding 
that uh, by doing so, you basically keep the transaction in the offer stage, which can, which can be revoked at any given time, you know? So uh, we want to be very detail-oriented. Example, let's say you don't ask the listing agent for all of the um, documents that are required, or let's say it's a uh, property that is uh, built before 78, the listing agent had, hasn't provided you yet with the uh, lead-based paint disclosure, and you're just being lazy, and you send off your offer, and you ask the uh, listing agent to send it back with the lead-based paint disclosure. Well, what happens? The seller, let's say, accepts all of the terms of your offer and returns it with the lead-based paint disclosure, which, of course, the buyer hasn't signed yet. So it really technically is a counteroffer because the seller is now countering back with, you know, accepting the original documents, but now adding a new document to it. And... Uh, until the buyer accepts that, the seller could rescind the offer. So let's say it's the weekend and uh, you, knew, you thought you had an awesome deal. It's a full price offer. Uh, the, the buyer is approved for FHA financing. It's going to close in 45 days, yada, yada, yada. And uh, another agent that had been looking at this thing calls the listing agent and says, you know, my buyer is, uh, loves this place. Uh, they're going to uh, make an all cash offer, $10,000 below asking price, but we can close in two weeks. Well, to the seller, that could very well be the better offer. And so the seller, especially if they have a competent listing agent, you know, could just fire off a message rescinding the offer, the prior offer, because again, it hasn't been fully accepted yet. And there's nothing the buyer or you can do about it. And again, um, in my lifetime in this industry, I've personally done probably five, 600 transactions and I've seen well over 3,000 transactions and I've seen things go sideways many, many, many times because agents didn't understand uh, the importance of making sure that the document is tied and that when the other party accepts it, you have a done deal and not something where something is missing where they're gonna have to send it back to you and you really just you know, remaining in that counteroffer state. So it's very, very important. And uh, I'm going to walk through the, the documents now. I'm going to share to, uh, you know, to the uh, uh, screen, uh, change to the screen sharing. But a um, couple of things I want to point out today is um, uh, the differences between a traditional contract and, a, um, uh, and an as-is contract and some of the things that that you may not be aware of, changes that have taken place, you know, the contracts are being changed all of the time, there's going to be another change coming up very shortly with uh, respect to the, uh, the financing contingencies, and um, and so you don't want to be one of those agents that, that, you know, really truly understood that contract five years ago, but today there are some big, big things that, uh, um, that have been added or changed, so uh, I'm going to walk you through that. Also, I've seen a trend in general since the meltdown um, to using as-is contracts. You know, uh, when I first got started in real estate, there were no as-is contracts. There was no such thing as a short sale. Uh, you know, short sales took place in the stock market, but not in real estate. And so the as-is contract was used only by uh, serious real estate investors. And nine out of 10 times, we didn't even use an as-is contract. We used an as-is addendum to the regular contract. Um, once the, you know, the short sale thing started and the, uh, and the REO sale started, uh, the assets contract was required. You know, the seller wasn't going to make any repairs. The lender, of course, wasn't going to make any repairs. So it became really a, the standard contract became the assets contract. And um, probably 95 percent, 19 out of 20 transactions uh, were using the assets contract, which was really a flip flop from what it was before. Now. Since uh, 2014, that disaster is gone. Most of you will probably never do a short sale, or if you're going to do one, maybe once a year. It's a very rare uh, situation nowadays. And, uh, and unless you're working with an REO lender that requires as as contracts, uh, you have to ask yourself, okay, why would I use an as as contract as opposed to just being an automatic pilot because you've been using the as as contract for the last five years while using the as as contract every all the time, you know? 
And um, so, somebody told me a, a good uh, explanation or analogy to make it very simple, uh, you know, difference between those two contracts. Um, the as-is contract is a contract that allows the buyer to walk for any reasons, okay? So if you're working with a buyer that um, isn't sure, is looking at multiple properties, making maybe making offers on multiple properties simultaneously, which happens sometimes with investors, if they need to have the ability to walk away from the deal for any reasons at all, then the as-is contract is what you would want to use because that stipulation is part of that contract. Um, if you're working with a um, buyer that uh, really wants to have that property, um, then you want to use a traditional contract because a traditional contract, if you in implement the repair limits uh, properly, the seller cannot walk away from that, prop from that transaction, nor can the buyer walk away from the transaction. If you're working with a seller, you would almost always want to have a traditional contract. Um, a lot of sellers too, for whatever reason, maybe they were misinformed by the real estate agent, they just want an as-is contract uh, so they don't have to make any repairs. Um, but they don't understand and appreciate the fact that the buyer that is making an offer is really meaningless until the inspection period is over because the buyer can walk at any moment in time. So how serious is that? That would be like taking an offer with, you know, the earnest money deposit being put down in three weeks after the inspections. Um, so if you have a seller that is concerned about um, uh, having to make repairs, uh, request that the repair limit be zero, but on a traditional standard contract. Because now the seller has all of the power. The seller, number one, can choose to make repairs. The buyer has absolutely no way to terminate the contract um, unless there were required repairs that are you know, truly warranted items and then the seller refuses to make those repairs. Um, so the power is with the seller. The seller can choose to not make repairs and let the buyer walk or the seller can choose to make the repairs and the buyer is locked in. So from, an as, from, a, from, a, uh, from the seller's perspective, the traditional contract is always, always much, much better. Um, so you may want to educate your sellers accordingly before you put must have as is contract in the um, uh, in the MLS uh, uh, property disclosure, you know, realtor only comments. Um, there are two reasons deals fall apart. Okay, um, the first reason is on an as is contract, the buyer changes their mind, they get the inspections back for whatever reason, or they find something better during those two weeks that the inspection period is there. So that's the first reason why deals fall apart. And then the second reason, of course, is financing, where things don't uh, happen the way they're supposed to happen by the um, um, by closing. So I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to change my screen and I'm going to go on to form simplicity. And uh, we'll go through both types of contracts and a couple of these disclosures um, just so that you you know have a good understanding of them and some of the nuances and differences that you want to look out for also with respect to timelines that are that are incredibly important so I'm going to take my webcam off and uh, I'm going to turn on my screen sharing Faces on my screen, and I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> Just bear with me. My uh, computer is uh, hanging a little bit here. Okay, here we go. All right. Can everyone see my screen? No. Okay, hold on. It's still loading. I don't see anything. Okay, hold on. Start sharing my screen. Monitor on. Mine says loading top is top of the screen. It's got a uh, rapid. There you go. Yeah, there we got it. Okay. Right, you, you got the screen? Got it. Oh, got it. Very good. Okay. Got your desktop on there. Yep. So let's hop into form simplicity and. Uh, the fastest way to get into form simplicity is through your 
login. And we have a separate training on writing a contract with Form Simplicity that uh, walks you through how to get to Form Simplicity from the uh, MLS listing. So I'm not going to go there right now. So there are two ways to get to Form Simplicity. One is directly from the MLS listing. It has a little icon at the top. And if you take that route, the advantage is that um, all of the uh, property information is pulled into um, the transaction, so you don't have to retype the address and the legal and the seller's name and all that stuff. Um, but you can also get to form simplicity from here, from your uh, MMR login. There's you know form simplicity here, and it, it automatically logs you directly into form simplicity. And And once you're in your, in your uh, system here, you have your active transactions. And I created a testing only transaction, which I used to just load documents into it. And um, I have the as is residential contract here. We'll take a look at that in a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and find the regular residential contract. So I'm gonna click here on add forms and uh, I'm, I'm going to mute you guys so we don't have that uh, feedback loop. President Trump's coming into the room. Here we go. So I muted you guys. Um, I'll unmute you after, at the end of the meeting. Residential contract for sale and purchase is at the very big, uh, bottom. So I'm going to add it to the transaction. And you can, by the way, create your own templates with informed simplicity. Um, let's say condominium purchase as is, condominium purchase uh, with a regular contract. And that way you can um, reuse all the documents. You don't have to chase them down when you write an offer. Um, so this is the as-is residential contract, and let's take a look at the dates down here. Uh, so this is revised 0216. Um, so this is the most recent uh, Farbar contract, and um, the uh, uh, Form Simplicity, which is owned by Florida Realtors, will always have the most up-to-date information here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to unmute you guys again. Um, so if you have any questions, you can ask them. But I suggest that you mute yourself while you're not asking a question so that uh, we don't have a, you know, feedback loops if, some, if someone's uh, computer picks up their own sound. So the top part here is very standard. Seller, buyers, and um, one point here is when you see a property... Uh, that says owner of record. Um, when I get that, if I were a listing uh, a listing agent and the buyer submits that to me, I would, uh, unless it's an REO, I would just think lazy buyer agent because there's no reason to put owner of record in here, even if the listing agent doesn't disclose it in the MLS, which is stupid, because you can just go in the tax roll and see who the owner of record is. Um, so the first part here is all standard stuff, and it's the same for all um, uh, contracts. Now, one note here about personal property. It already lists certain types of personal property. So you don't have to put stove, dishwasher, uh, refrigerator in here because it's already up there. Now, if somebody doesn't want to sell their stove, of course, you would exclude it down here and put, you know, stove is excluded. So, uh, but any other personal property that is not listed in here, um, you would want to list here with conveys, like a hot tub on the on the on the on the deck, for example. Uh, purchase price, very important, of course. Initial deposit. Um, I believe that really uh, an earnest money deposit should accompany all offers, um, unless 
the seller is somewhere in Timbuktu in Africa and you can't get a hold of them and they can't get, get you a check. But um, you ideally want to check this off and then you do need to list the escrow agent information who is holding that earnest uh, money deposit check. If this is a situation where the seller is going to pay for title um, and you don't know who the seller's title company is going to be, you can use Berlin Patton, um, the preferred provider that we, we use, uh, their real estate law firm, and they'll transfer the earnest money over. You know, So there's a difference between the escrow agent and the closing agent. The closing agent is the uh, party that does the title searches and the title insurance and the actual closing. The escrow agent is the party that holds the earnest money deposit. Um, the two are usually the same, but they can be different. You know, let's say if it's a very, very big transaction, the buyer may say, you know, even though the seller is uh, uh, paying for title and the seller is designating the closing agent, um, I want my attorney to hold the earnest money deposit in his escrow account, in his trust account. So the escrow agent may be the attorney for the buyer that's holding the money and that will then wire the money at closing to the closing agent. So the two can be uh, separate. And, uh, and then we have additional deposits, of course. Financing, very important. I've seen contracts where this column was left blank. And that's a problem, which we'll find in a minute when we go to uh, the financing contingency. So you've got to put something in there. Is it 80 percent? Is it 90 percent? Is it 97 percent? Or do you have the exact dollar amount? Um, you know, put that in here. If you put a dollar amount or percentage in here, it'll actually auto-calculate the balance down here. But uh, you can also type just the word balance down here. But it will auto-calculate it. So let's say the purchase price is 400000 and the earnest money is 5000 um, and the uh, financing here is, uh, let's say, 300000 it go it calculates it over. If it's uh, 90%, it calculates it, uh, calculates the amount, okay, 80%. Calculates the amount. So you want to put something in there um, because the financing contingency speaks to this. On old contracts, there was a, a, a line in the financing contingency itself. And then we got the dates here, of course, closing date and so forth. Uh, when it comes to dates, very important. Um, we used to have a scenario many, many years ago where some sale contracts went by calendar days, some sale contracts went by business days. And that has been changed. So it's always calendar days, and it ends on the uh, if the uh, if the uh, deadline ends on a Saturday or Sunday or holiday, then it's going to be the next uh, next business day. Extension of closing dates, occupancy and possession. Uh, very important. If there is going to be a lease, or if there's going to be a lease back, or if there's going to be uh, a holdover where the seller gets to stay for three more months. Got to check this off here. Um, assignability, you know, buyer may assign and be released, may assign but not release, or may not assign this contract. You want to check something here. Again, you want to be diligent. Imagine you go ahead and write up the offer and everything else is perfect and you forget to check this box. And then the seller responds to everything. They accept everything, but they check off that box. Well, that makes it a counter offer. And uh, now the seller can rescind that counter offer all the way until the buyer actually initials, signs off on it, and returns it back to the uh, uh, to the listing agent. So it's very, very important that you're just diligent and make sure that all the boxes are ticked off because. Anything that could give the seller a reason to make a change or an adjustment would turn that thing into um, an offer. And right now we're very much in a seller's market, so um, you just don't want to take that risk. Financing, there are two possibilities. This uh, will pay cash for uh, cash at closing, so the buyer can still get a loan, but if the buyer is supremely confident that you know they're not going to have any issues with the financing. And if there were an issue, they could pay cash. They could check this box, even if they're not paying cash, even if they're getting a loan. But this will basically 
waive any uh, financing contingency. So if they can't get financing, then they'll lose the deposit. Then the other one here is the country's contingent upon by obtaining a written loan commitment for a conventional FHA. So if you only check this box, and for some reason they can't get FHA financing, but they could get conventional financing, um, they're still not qualifying for FHA financing, so they're not delivering on the uh, on the financing uh, uh, contingency. And down here, see, if buyer does not receive loan commitment uh, by loan commitment date, then thereafter either party may cancel this contract. Um, so hypothetically, let's say for example the buyer doesn't qualify for financing but they do get conventional financing, but the seller is now having someone that is willing to pay more money, the seller could hypothetically terminate the contract because the financing contingency was not met. Um, it obviously is very far stretched and, and it will never ever happen. But um, I would talk to the buyer and say, listen, um, if you only qualify for FHA financing, then of course go here. But if you qualify for either one, check both boxes up. It will also give more certainty to the um, um, the seller. Up here, check one either fixed or adjustable, and an interest rate not to exceed left blank than prevailing rate based on buyer's credit worthiness. So uh, you don't have to put something in there, but it might be a good idea depending on the uh, uh, situation for the, for the buyer. Uh, buyer should make one loan application within five days. And uh, so again, if the buyer uh, cannot get a loan commitment, then um, either party, buyer or seller, can cancel. By buyer's written notice to seller, the buyer has either received or elected to make finance contingency or seven days prior to closing. So this is very important. This basically means that if the buyer cannot get financing, then either party can cancel this thing pretty much at any time, all the way up to seven days prior to closing, unless the buyer delivers a, uh, a notice that they now got a loan commitment letter or elect to waive the financing contingency. So, in other words, let's say the buyer doesn't get um, their, their loan commitment and um, the seller, in theory, could cancel the contract, but the seller doesn't cancel the contract and now the buyer does get a loan commitment from someone else. Well, now that the loan commitment has been presented, the seller can no longer cancel. Um, if you have a buyer that can't get a loan commitment but wants to pay cash, let's say, for example, very, very important that you have that buyer uh, waive the financing contingency, which then extinguishes the seller's ability to, to terminate the contract. Um, closing cost fees. Here we have that option. Seller shall designate, designate closing agent or buyer shall designate closing agent. So again, these two things are two different terms. Closing agent does not equal escrow agent, and they do not have to be the same. Um, most of the times they are, but they're two def different roles. Two different parties can um, fill that need. Now here we're talking about different kind of, uh, uh, you know, the survey, by when the survey has to be done. Home warranty again, check NA, don't leave it open for the seller to uh, check it off and, um, and create a counter offer. Uh, special assessments. Um, it says here check one, but in the box is checked and option A shall be deemed uh, selected. Sometimes, um, you know, with condominiums, of course, there may be a special assessment, but even with single family home, there may be a special assessment. Maybe there's uh, a plan to replace septic with sewer and bring sewer in and every property is going to be assessed X dollars or maybe they're going to redo the roads and as part of that every property is going to be assessed X dollars. So you got to determine 
as part of your local lean search, first of all, is there is if there is an assessment. Um, number two, who's going to pay for it? You know, are you going to have the seller pay for it? Are you going to have the buyer pay for it? Um, I personally, um, if you want to make sure that the deal is solid and no one is going to walk, then I would select option A, which basically means that the uh, seller pays for anything that's due prior to closing, the buyer pays for anything thereafter. Um, if it's a concern, then I would check option B and ask the seller to pay the assessment in full. Um, when it comes to contracts, there's also another train of thought. Uh, you know, on one hand, you want to make your contract as solid as possible. Uh, and especially if you're submitting a full price offer, you want to have that very, very tight. Um, but if you're not making a full price offer, the second train of thought is you want to have uh, as many possibilities for negotiation as possible. So let's say if you're making an offer that is, you know, $20,000 below asking price, that is one thing the seller is obviously going to look at that, but then another item could be the seller contribution to buyer's closing cost. Another thing mm -hmm. could be asking the seller to pay for, for title and, uh, and uh, closing expenses. Another one could be to ask the seller to pay for all of these assessments. Another one could be asking the seller to pay for a home warranty. And so you stack these things up. And then it'll become apparent what's really most important to the seller. You know, maybe the seller is really fixated on the price, but they're okay with the uh, um, uh, con cash contribution towards buyer's closing costs. Um, now here we have the property inspection rights to cancel. Okay, and there are a couple of two, three uh, differences between this contract. And, um, and other contracts. So let's take a look at this. And uh, by the way, I started out with the as is contract. So I uh, meant to start out with the other contract, but it doesn't matter. The um, everything up to this point is pretty much the same, but here now uh, where the changes happen between the two contracts. So let's go over the as is first. So this one here, the buyer has X days to cancel. Um, I personally would always push for 15 days, uh, sometimes even a little bit more, 20 days if you can. Uh, if it's an REO, the lender will almost always ask for 10 days. Um, now let's read this whole thing. Buyer shall have X days after effective date, inspection period within which to have such inspection of property from this buyer uh, shall desire during the inspection period. Buyer determines that sole discretion of the property is not acceptable and buyer may turn this contract, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, now, first difference here is the buyer does not have to use licensed inspectors. The buyer could do self-inspection. The buyer could have his cousin Vinny that is not a licensed inspector do the inspection. Um, and the buyer can cancel for any reason at all. Um, you know, if they just wake up in the morning and decide that they don't like the color of the roof. Um, they can terminate the contract and get their stuff back. Um, the term here that is referenced elsewhere in the contract is inspection period. Okay, and uh, so here's a paragraph that talks about seller's existence in a corporation and closing of building permits. If buyer's inspection of the property identifies open or needed building permits, and seller shall promptly deliver to buyer all plans, written documentation, yada yada yada. So it's very important here that anything related to permits gets inspected as part of the inspection period. And, um, and there's something called um, a permit search. And a permit search is part of the local lien search. And, um, and you have to get that done during the inspection period. Okay. Um, some buyers, they don't want to spend the money. Oh my God, you know, they're going to charge me $75 or $100 for a local lien search. I'm going to hold off on that. Well, if during the inspection period, they choose not to do those inspections, including permits, they can't do it later. 
you know, uh, the right to cancel is extinguished after that inspection period is, uh, is over. And so the, uh, if the buyer has any inspections done after the inspection period, um, they can't be used to, to terminate the contract. And so as um, the buyer agent, you want to make sure that when um, you have an executed contract, that you ask whoever the title company is going to be to immediately order uh, a local lien and permit search. So you have those results back before the end of the inspection period. And if for some reason the inspection period um, you know, comes to an end and you don't have the permit uh, search back, then ask for an extension. You know, you could do an addendum to the contract that uh, extends the inspection period specifically only with respect to, to permits. Um, but you want to make sure you get that information before the inspection period ends. Um, here talks about the escrow agent and, um, and defaults, dispute resolution, title, title examination, surveys, liens, and so forth. Uh, so these are all pretty standard um, terms that are the same for each of the two types of contracts. Um, you do want to read through them. Uh, foreign investment, FIRPTA, is very important. Um, the amounts of withholding have been changed now for properties. Um, so it's no longer just a, a flat 10% of the, of the sale price. Compliance with FIRPTA is the buyer's responsibility, not the seller's. Um, so you want to make sure that you um, confirm that the seller is a U.S. Uh, person or uh, as opposed to a foreign person. And, uh, and usually the title company attorney will do that, but you want to make sure that, uh, that they're on top of that. Now this here is also very important. Um, any of these addendums and writers that are included with the contract are made part of the contract. So for instance, I talked about lead-based paid uh, disclosure earlier, but let's say a condominium writer or homeowners association disclosure. Um, let's say you submit a contract. We just had that happen actually this weekend. Um, you submit a contract with the condominium rider, which is an important document, and it uh, it addresses more than just the right uh, to the document uh, to the, you know the three day right to rescission and the right to certain condominium documents. But there are other things that are covered in the condominium rider as well. So let's say you submit your contract, and the seller accepts. And returns your contract but they don't return the condominium writer well we don't have a fully executed contract because part of the contract is missing I and mean, that would be like them leaving out three pages from the middle of the contract you know uh, we don't know if the seller made changes to the writer we don't know if the seller accepted the writer uh, we don't know if there are things that we thought are one thing or different on the writer and were were moved around so you got to get everything back and, uh, and not get excited about, oh my God, you know, I have the, uh, the contract back. We get, now I have a fully executed contract, but then it turns out that something is missing. And if they send you the rider three days later, guess what? The effective date of the contract is going to be three days later. Um, so uh, very, very important that, number one, you check the box if a document is included. If you don't check the box, then the document technically really is not included. And number two, if uh, if you do include documents and you check out the boxes here that uh, you uh, get them back. There are some things that are not uh, listed here. For example, seller's property disclosure. Okay, So I would type under additional terms, seller's property disclosure is part of this contract. And, uh, and just make sure that that, that, that that is part of the contract. Um, so down here, of course, we have the uh, options for the seller to counter or reject uh, the buyer's offer. Don't assume that if you have your buyer make an offer on a seller's property and you wanted to have an answer by five o'clock tonight and uh, you didn't receive uh, an answer back that, you know, at six o'clock your buyer can just make an offer on something else and this old offer is dead. Um, you don't want to have a situation where the buyer now buys something else, put that on, puts that on the contract, and now the seller on Monday returns 
uh, the accepted contract uh, to you. And, uh, and they say that, well, we'll sign it at this time. And, um, and you failed to rescind the offer. So when you make multiple offers, if an offer is not accepted, formally rescind that offer, you know. So if, uh, just so that you have that paper trail, fire off an email to the uh, listing agent um, you know, here by formally rescinding the offer. And, uh, and that'll just uh, keep you out of hot water. Um, another thing uh, down here, and this is for both uh, uh, regular and as is contract, I see so many times, probably one out of three times, that the sales associate puts their name in here, um, you know, Jim Smith, 3%. And, uh, and here's something right there. This contract shall not modify any MLS or other offer compensation made by seller or listing broker to cooperating brokers. Okay, the the brokers are not party to the contract. The broker isn't signing the contract and agreeing to a higher or lower commission. Um, it's no one's business what the co broker commission is on there, uh, and it certainly doesn't belong there. You know, so um, if you. There are smart agents sometimes that think, oh, you know, the listing only said 2.5% cobra, let me put 3% in here, you know. Um, don't be that buyer agent that does that. Now, if you're the listing agent and uh, a buyer agent makes an offer and they put 3% in there because they would like to get 3%, I wouldn't say anything about it. I would just uh, get the contract accepted and then after it's accepted and effective with the title company, I would say, by the way, I have no idea why you wrote that there. You obviously didn't read the sentence above it. You know, you're getting what's, what's offered in the MLS. And, um, and so uh, just as an FYI, um, I've seen listing agents where the buyer agents put in a higher commission in here and they paid them at closing, you know. Um, so just be aware of that. Again, it's very clear here. The contract has nothing to do with the compensation and the brokers are not party to this compensation. If, for example, you had in here something of the, um, let's say you give a realtor credit to the um, uh, buyer. Let's say the realtor is going to pay for a home warranty. It does not belong in here. The realtor is not party to this contract. Okay. Um, the buyer and seller can write in there whatever, but they cannot um, encumber or obligate another person. That would be like writing in here that uh, the seller's neighbor will give the buyer their own more. You know, I mean, that's <laughs> uh, you can write that in there, but it's meaningless. So if uh, you as the list, as the buyer agent are making a concession, a realtor credit, um, a uh, um, uh, you know, buying the home warranty, whatever it might be, that's between you and the buyer. Uh, the seller has nothing to do with that. The seller doesn't need to know that. It's none of their concern, none of their business. That is something that you would write up between them. Just a simple thing. Um, you know, I hereby want to confirm that I'm going to pay for X at closing. And, um, and an email would can be suffice for that. Can I ask a question then, Thomas? Yes, sir. Uh, just just involved in this, I just uh, had a contract where um, X number of dollars came to an agreement where the, um, the seller would pay up to certain amounts of money uh, at the closing for a uh, buyer's expenses. Well, that's but fine. Then, okay, go ahead. Came back, that part wasn't an issue. I mean, we signed all the way through, but then the, the uh, listing agent said, would it be okay if the seller just paid commission on the, the, the amount less than 5,000 of the words, the deal was for two <coughs> uh, would, would it be okay if I accept the commission based on 225? Okay, so here's here's the situation. So you got multiple things going on. You have, first of all, the seller can, agreeing to pay the buyer's uh, uh, X dollars towards closing costs. So that belongs in the contract that's between the buyer and the seller. Um, if the listing agent is asking you would you be willing to accept your uh, compensation based on the net after uh, person? I would say no. You know, it's like, okay, the buyer's paying for title. Are you going to ask me to calculate the commissions on the uh, sale price after deducting title and other expenses the seller has? So, yeah, my answer to that category would be no. I would say the listing okay. agent, you know, yeah. oh. <laughs> if, if, if you want to reduce your commission to the seller as a listing agent, 
that's up to you. I mean, you can waive your commission to the listing agent. You can I mean, to the seller. You designate that. That's what I'm saying. Well, I mean, rem rem remember, so there are three doc three contracts here, or three documents. The first one is the sale and purchase contract. The two the two parties to that contract are the seller and the buyer, and the buyer and seller can agree between themselves. Uh, and so the seller giving the buyer money towards closing costs, that's an agreement between the buyer and the seller. So that's document number one. Document number two is the listing agreement. So the listing agreement states that, okay, the seller is going to pay the uh, listing agent, the listing broker, X dollars or X percent in exchange for finding a buyer. Okay, so that is the document that determines how much the listing broker gets paid. And if it says 6%, then the listing broker gets paid 6%. Um, nowadays, the listing agreements also disclose what co-broke shall be offered in the MLS, but the, uh, the, the seller is not responsible for pay paying the buyer agent. The seller is only responsible for paying the, um, the, the listing broker. And then the third thing is the listing in the MLS. The listing in the MLS is an offer of compensation. So the listing broker offers a buyer broker X dollars or X percent or whatever it might be um, for bringing them the buyer. Okay. So <clears throat> in your particular scenario, the um, there is the issue of does the listing agent want to charge the seller less That's up to the listing agent? I mean, the listing agent can say, okay, I'm only going to charge 6% on the net amount and they really should have something in writing with the seller that is not of our concern or not the listing agent. Um, the, uh, the second issue is the offer of compensation in the MLS. Now, you could agree to a lower compensation after the fact. Uh, but I just wouldn't do it personally. I would just say, no, I'm sorry. Um, you, you're welcome to reduce your compensation. And so if the listing agent, let's say, were to get only 6% on 245 as opposed to 250, you are still entitled to 3% on the 250. Okay. So, so that, that's how that would work. But if, any, if you ever see anything like that addressed in the contract, let's say on the counter offer or something, it says, um, uh, you know, uh, seller sh uh, sh uh, shall pay compensation only based on the uh, net amount after deducting the buyer contribution. I wouldn't say anything about it. I would just let it be because again, the contract very clearly states the contract cannot renegotiate uh, the offer of compensation. You know, that the seller and the listing broker deal between themselves how much the seller thinks they deserve to get paid. Um, we are concerned only with the offer of compensation that was made in the MLS when it comes to, um, uh, uh, you know, how much we get paid from the uh, listing broker at closing. Okay? I understand. All right. Okay. So, so we went through the as is contract. So let's take a look at the regular contract and. Uh, Make sure that this is the regular contract here. Okay, so this is the uh, regular residential contract for sale and purchase. And I'm just going to go over it and point out some of the key differences um, that really deal with inspections and right to cancel that are very, very important to, to understand. So all of this part here is, is the same. And... Uh, Closing date, nothing changes there. Um, financing, nothing changes there. Um, I forgot to point out earlier, the financing contingency is for a loan in the loan amount, see paragraph 2C, okay? So I saw an offer the other day where the loan amount was blank. And, uh, and it showed, you know, it was like this, $400,000, $5,000 uh, deposit. And it was supposed to have 80% financing, but there was nothing in the loan amount. And it was uh, 395 So what does that mean? Financing, nothing, zero, $1, $5, 10% financing. We don't know. Basically, the way the contract was presented like that was um, there's no financing here, you know. Um, and uh, the listing agent actually caught it and requested that it uh, be corrected. But, uh, you know, the devil is in the details here. Um, assignment, all of this stuff is the same. Closing cost. 
All right. Closing costs, fee, and other charges. So here is a difference. Um, and I'm going to dig into that a little bit. The, um, we got this customary costs, you know, doc stamps, owner's top policy, if, if uh, X is checked. So let's see, a cost to be paid by the seller. Documentary stamp, uh, owner's policy, if it's selected that they pay for, for title. Title search charges, if it's selected that they pay for it. Municipal lien search, if it's uh, checked that they're going to pay for it. Um, HOA condominium estoppel fees, recording and other fees, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Now, here we also have this now. Shall, seller shall pay the following amounts, percentage for the following cost and expenses. Okay. Um, X dollars or 1% or 2%, if left blank, 1.5% for general repair items. Okay. They used to be called warranted repair items. They call them now general repair items. And we'll go over what that means. That's the general repair limit. Um, one half percent for uh, wood destroying organism treatment or repairs, and uh, one half percent for costs associated with closing out open or expired building permits. So again, like I said before, uh, this contract obligates the seller to pay up to that amount for those repairs. Um, the uh, you can set it to zero. You can make it zero percent, which then means that the seller is not obligated to make any repairs, but the seller could still make those repairs, okay? So, let's take a look what it says here. If prior to closing, seller is unable to meet the maintenance requirement as required, or the repairs, replacement, treatments, and permitting as required, then sums equal to 125% of estimated cost to complete, uh, not in excess of general uh, repair limits, uh, shall be escrowed at closing. If actual cost of required repairs exceed applicable escrow, escrow amount, seller shall pay such actual cost, but not in excess of general repair limits. Um, so the, uh, the seller is not obligated to pay for more. So what this basically says is that, okay, if, uh, uh, if regular repair items are found or if there are issues with uh, termites and so forth, the seller agrees to pay for that amount. If it can't be done prior to closing, then 125% of the estimated costs shall be held in escrow to pay for it after closing, and as long as it doesn't exceed uh, the repair limit. Um, here the cost to be paid by the buyer, title evidence insurance is the same. Survey, um, on before title evidence deadline, buyer needs to get a survey, of course. Uh, special assessments, just like before. Um, disclosures, just like before. Okay, here's where it gets interesting and where it's different. Inspection period, property inspections and repair. So the buyer shall have 15 days, let's say, after effective date, but with gin, uh, buyer may at buyer expense conduct general, which strong organism and permanent inspections described below. So again, we got that time frame, and all of these inspections, including the permit search, have to happen in that time frame. And then the buyer has to give notice to the seller. If buyer fails to timely deliver to seller a written notice or report, um, then except for seller's continuing maintenance requirement, buyer shall have waived seller's obligation. Okay? So, uh, it's so critical that not only is the inspection done, but the notice is given within that time frame, or the seller has no obligation. So let's say, for example, you get all the inspections done. Uh, today is day 15, uh, but you don't give notice about the permit issue or the repair issues until day after tomorrow, which is day 17. Um, guess what? Um, you drop the ball as the buyer agent. The seller has absolutely zero obligation to do any of these things, and the buyer cannot walk. And if the thing, the deal goes. Uh, if it becomes a dispute, then guess who's going to get sued? Uh, we are. So uh, uh, very, very important that you stay on top of these, uh, these time frames and ask for an extension if necessary. So let's look at, the, at what is covered. Okay. So those items specified in paragraph 12B below, which says obligated to repair or replace, are the general repair limit items. May be inspected by a person who specializes in and holds an occupational license to conduct home inspections, blah, blah, blah. 
Okay. So licensed individuals must do the inspections. The buyer cannot just self inspect and, uh, and say, well, you know, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. This needs to be done. No, it has to be a properly licensed person that is going to do this. Um, the buyer could do self inspections if there's a separate addendum executed to that effect that states that the buyer can do the inspections themselves. So let's take a look at the, uh, um, <clears throat> what the general repair items are, uh, because there's confusion about that, you know. The following items shall be uh, free of leaks, water damage, or structural damage. The ceiling, roof, including glass shear soffits, exterior and interior walls, um, doors, windows, and foundation. Okay, so free of leaks, water damage, or structural damage. If the inspector finds that the roof is 27 years old and at the end of its uh, useful life and it needs to be replaced in the next one or two years, but there are no roof leaks, there's no water damage, there's no structural damage of the roof, guess what? Um, the seller is not obligated to do anything about it. Um, if the AC is not, um, uh, it works properly, it's in working condition, but it, um, it's you know 30 years old and held together by duct tape, then, um, then that's fine, you know? So you wanna go through this here uh, very specifically uh, of what needs to be done, okay? Torn screens, including pool and patio screens, fogged windows or missing roof tiles and shingles shall be repaired or replaced by seller prior to closing. Seller's not required to repair or replace cosmetic conditions unless cosmetic condition resulted from a defect, okay? So, uh, a uh, cosmetic condition would be, for example, um, you know, stain on the ceiling, but if the stain on the ceiling is a result of water damage, then it needs to be, um, but, you know, pitted marsh side, things like that. None of that has to be uh, repaired. So, uh, very, very important that uh, you familiarize yourself with, with this category. And so, again, the, um, the, the key difference between the as-is and the regular contract with respect to inspections and repairs is with an as-is contract, anyone can do the inspections uh, and the buyer can cancel for any reason whatsoever. They don't have to provide a report. They don't have to give any reasons. They can just cancel. Um, if they don't cancel by the end of the uh, uh, inspection period, then they're, they're accepting the property as it is where it is. Um, on a traditional contract, a non-as-is contract, the um, buyer and seller agree to uh, repair limits. And the buyer has to get the inspections done within a certain time frame and give notice within that time frame of what uh, repair items they're requesting to be fixed. Most of all, when you're working for the seller, you're going to find that the buyer's request is going to include all sorts of things which are not covered items. And then the seller is just going to uh, inform them that, you know, we're going to do part, uh, number one and number three, but all the other stuff we're not because it's not a required item. And... Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, if the repairs exceed the repair limit, then the seller is not obligated uh, to do it and uh, the contract could be terminated in that case. So uh, um, when you're working as, as a buyer agent with the buyer, you want to also explain this part to the buyer um, when they write the contract because you don't want to have a situation where the buyer thinks that um, the seller would be required to do all of these repairs uh, and it turns out they're all cosmetic items and the seller is not obligated to do any of these things and, uh, and yes on one hand you can say well, I'm a transaction broker and you know you should have read the contract but um, we all know that you know buyers signing a 12 page contract they're not reading the contract and so you want to point out the important things to the uh, to the buyer um, before they sign it, so that you don't end up getting um, in the crossfire for you know failure to do your job. Um, that's Good great. Question. Yes. Good question, Steve. Um, I closed the deal about two months ago, and it was a um, as-is contract. And we looked around. Uh, there were things that needed to be done, but I said to the buyer, I said, "This is an as-is contract." He still insisted that the seller fix the door and this and that. And it was a little pushback, pushback and forth on that.
So um, I think <coughs> the listing agent that they could fix these things, mm -hmm. and uh, it never happened. But well, here's the thing. I mean, buyers get, buyers get confused about that. Too. They do, and you know the thing. Um, here's what a buyer can do: if you have an as-is contract, and and there are items found that are significant, the buyer can always say to the seller prior to the end of the inspection period, and it has to be done in writing, and it needs to be a, a, a properly drafted written notice where the seller then acknowledges and agrees. Um, but basically what the buyer would have to do is say, um, unless the seller agrees to make the following repairs, I'm hereby exercising my right to cancel the contract. And then, um, and then have a line there for the seller, seller agrees and accepts to make those repairs. So you're basically giving the seller a Montessori and choice and say, listen, uh, we'll move forward with the contract if you do X, Y, Z. Um, and you're basically amending the contract because the, con the seller is not obligated to do those repairs for the contract. Or right. gonna, we're going to cancel and move on. You know? And sometimes, because the seller is already pregnant, they already went out and, and, and put in an offer on another house that they fell in love with. You know, sometimes that strategy can work as long as you're not going too crazy. You know, sometimes the seller is going to say, you know what, I'd rather spend $1,000 and get this deal closed than to have to renege on the deal that I just put on the contract and put this back in the market and God knows when it's going to sell and then I'm going to have to you know, probably maybe even get less anyhow, you know, so. Can you send, can you send that written notice, uh, say, within seven days after the inspection? No. What's that? What's you, that? Go ahead. You, you, the, the buyer either terminates the contract or accepts it as is within the inspection period. Once the inspection period has lapsed on an as-is contract, the buyer is accepting the property as is where it is, and the seller has absolutely no obligation whatsoever uh, to do anything and if the buyer refuses to close and the buyer is going to lose their their earnest money deposit and the seller could even sue for performance I mean, let's okay. say the, let's say the buyer refuses to close the buyer's like oh i don't care i got a 500 hundred dollar earnest money deposit big deal well let's say the property was in the contract for two hundred thirty thousand dollars and now six months later the seller ends up selling it for 190. well the seller can turn around and sue the buyer for for because they didn't perform for that forty thousand dollar that they lost you know um so it is a serious matter. It's not just losing the uh, the, uh, uh, the earnest money deposit, uh, but the, the seller could sue the buyer for performance, just like vice versa. The seller decides I'm not going to close. I'm not going. I'm not going to close. I don't care. Well, the buyer could sue the seller for performance. You know, so uh, uh, something to keep uh, in mind. All right. Let's see what else is here. Um, Dispute resolution, just as in the other one, you know, they like to get people to uh, use mediators, but the truth is, uh, in this country and in this state, um, if somebody wants to sue, you can sue whether there's a mediation clause in there or not, so it's fairly uh, meaningless. Um, you could have your buyer cross it out sometimes, um, you know, especially with higher end properties where um, a buyer or seller is having a contract reviewed by their attorney, they'll probably just cross this part out here. Um, and that's, again, something you want to go over with the, with the, uh, with the um, uh, buyer. Also, we're not attorneys, you know. So if it's a large transaction, it's very common, you know, if you have a two, three, four, five million dollar property that there is an addendum, you know, subject to attorney review and approval um, with, uh, with the contract. Um, See if there's anything else on here that is different. No, nope, that's pretty much it. So all the other stuff is uh, is the same as in the other contracts. So again, the the two main differences here is that um, on one hand, the uh, buyer can cancel for any reason within a certain time, but then once that time is up, if they didn't cancel, they accept the property as is where is with all warts and problems and issues that there might be, no matter how bad they are. Um, on the other, with the regular contract, the buyer cannot back out. Really, the power is with the seller. The seller has the right to cancel um, uh, if the uh, repair um, uh, repairs exceed the repair limit. You know, so I can say, no, I'm not going to do it. Okay, and if you don't like it, buyer, then we'll cancel the contract. So. Um, 
if you're working with a seller, the, the traditional contract is almost always better. Um, let's go take a look at a couple of, uh, of uh, disclosures. Actually, I'll, let me go back to the webcam and I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of other disclosures. Um, let me stop my screen share and go back on my webcam. <clears throat> um, there are a couple of things that agents uh, tend to um, overlook or forget, which can also become problematic. Um, and it deals with homeowners association versus condominium associations. Um, nowadays, the uh, seller's property disclosure statement also has language in there that talks about, you know, what the homeowners association dues are, etc. Um, that does not negate the homeowners association disclosure um, uh, form requirement, you know, and because there's additional information on that form that is not uh, in the seller's property disclosure. Um, likewise, on the um, condominium disclosure, a lot of sellers, instead of using a seller property disclosure form, they use a form called the condominium property disclosure. And uh, that form is basically like a seller's property disclosure, but it also has additional languages for condominiums. So it has, you know, who's the condo association, what are the dues, um, when are they, uh, you know, the monthly, quarterly, whatever, uh, are there any assessments, yada, yada, yada. So it addresses all that information, but, um, but there are other things that are not addressed that are in the condominium rider, which is why you want to use that condominium rider. Um, HOAs are a tricky subject because with an HOA, the, um, the seller has to give notice to the buyer that there is an HOA and what the dues are and if there are any assessments outstanding and failure to give that disclosure can permit the buyer to cancel the contract all the way to closing or until they get the disclosure, you know. So... Um, you want to make sure that the disclosure was given because otherwise the buyer could cancel. Um, the buyer in an HOA is really buying, it's a caveat emptor, buyer beware. There's no requirement for HOA documentation, HOA rules, HOA restrictions, uh, or any of that to be provided. Okay, uh, There's no three-day right of rescission that once you get the rules, if you don't like that, Okay, so let's say you have someone that is buying this house and their idea was, you know what, I'm going to retire here in five years, but in the meantime, I'm going to rent it out through Airbnb. I heard you can make a lot of money with that. You know, it's only five miles to the beach. Well, it turns out that the HOA uh, rules are that you can only rent one time, you know, once a year. Or let's say he wants to put his RV on the street or in his driveway or his boat, and it turns out that, no, you can't do that, you know. Um, so... The buyer is really responsible for researching that. And if you're working with a buyer that is buying a property in an HOA, um, although you're not obligated to as a transaction broker, as a single agent, the argument could be made that you owe that fiduciary. But as a, as a transaction broker, you, you have no obligation whatsoever. But it might be a smart thing to try and locate what the rules and regs are and let the person know that this is a deep restricted community and here are some of the things that you can or cannot do, okay? Um, with a condominium, there are a couple of other things that come into play and that's where the condo rider is so important. Um, the um, number one, within condominiums, within some condominiums, there are so-called rights of first refusal, you know? Sometimes the association has a right of first refusal. So if Joe Schmo is selling his condominium in the association, then the association has the right of first refusal to buy that unit. Uh, this might be the case, especially with smaller condominiums, where um, you know they really want to make sure that they control who um, owns in there, or maybe they have, uh, in, maybe they amended the, uh, the, uh, the the bylaws to add that requirement in there because. Um, somebody wants to accumulate the units to then turn it into an apartment or who knows, you know, there, there are all sorts of uh, reasons why that could be. Um, another uh, right of first refusal requirement that is much more common is that the members, the owners, have a right of first refusal. So you're buying in a, in a, in a beachfront condominium, let's say you own a, a unit there, and then uh, Sally Sue in, in unit two or three is going to put her property on the market 
she has to give you a right of first refusal. So if Sally Sue finds a buyer and that contract is executed, that contract needs to be provided to the members and the members have seven days or however long to raise their hand and say, hey, I want to buy it for that price, you know? So the members have a right of first refusal. And again, with smaller condominiums, that is often done because you want to kind of make, make sure you know who's going to move in or maybe you have a family member or a cousin or someone that might be interested in it. Um, so the condo writer speaks to that and discloses that. Uh, whether or not there is a right of first refusal, and if there is a right of first refusal, you know what the time frames are by which um, the uh, uh, contract has to be presented and so forth. Um, the second biggie is the condo docs, and I just went through that with uh, one of our agents that wrote an offer on a condominium, where and the story goes like this, and I've seen it all the time. Okay. Uh, you write an offer and you request the condo docs and the listing agent sends you a bunch of crap and says here are the condo docs and um, you know you want to believe the person so you accept them oh yeah we got the condo docs have the buyer sign the receipt for the condo docs and we're a-okay well it turns out that the condo docs may be incomplete they might be 30 years old um, you know who knows so very specific on condominiums, the buyer is entitled to number one, the articles of incorporation, and number two, the bylaws. Now those could be amended, you know, so if that condominium was set up, you know, 30, 40 years ago, um, odds are that those bylaws or those uh, articles have been amended since then, you know. So a printout from the public record of some 40 year old documents, you need to get verification that those are still uh, current. Um, the third thing is the rules and regulation of the association. You need to get something that is uh, current. You know, many times you have a situation where you know the seller bought this property 12 years ago. They lived in there, and now they're selling for whatever reason, and they got all these documents that they received when they bought the condominium, and so they hand, hand over those documents which also can be true for an HOA. And then, um, you know, the buyer takes the documents and accepts them. But really, you know, those are 12 year old documents. And back then you could have three dogs and now you can have zero dogs or something, you know. So you want to make sure that uh, the rules and regs are, are up to date. Uh, likewise, for the um, uh, question and answer sheet, um, you know, make sure you have an up to date document. And then last but not least, um, up to date, most current year end financials. You know, we're now in 2017, for example, so you should be getting 2016 year end financials. Um, many times, you know, the uh, listing agent or seller doesn't want to pay 50 bucks for a set of documents to the association. So they send you, I don't know, you know, 2004 financials. Um, so you want to make sure that you get the actual up to date information. And the buyer needs to understand that they need to look at that and evaluate the health of the condominium, you know. Um, let's say if you have a condominium that, um, you know, the roof is 20 years old, uh, it looks like it's going to need some repairs, it probably needs to get, needs to be painted at some point, you know, it kind of looks a little bit dated. And then you look at the reserves and they got a thousand dollars in reserves, that is a huge problem because guess what? everyone in there is going to be hit with a special assessment a year from now, six months from now, two years from now to make those repairs as opposed to another condominium that has, you know, $150,000 in reserves because they were managed properly and they have uh, the reserves in place to pay for those expenses, you know. Um, many times you see condominiums that are uh, managed on a very short-sighted fashion by the current owners to keep their dues down, you know. So instead of paying three hundred fifty dollars a month, which might be, you know, might include a hundred twenty dollars going to reserves, they only want to pay two hundred twenty or two hundred thirty dollars a month, which covers all of the expenses, sort of. So you, as a buyer agent and a buyer, like excited, oh my god, you know, this condo here is three hundred fifty dollars in due, but this condo here is only two hundred thirty dollars. Um, you get excited about the fact that the dues are low but uh, not realizing, you know, what is the financial health of, of the condominium. So it's very, very important. Probably the two most important uh, 
disclosures are, you know, the HOA disclosure and the condominium rider. And on the condominium side, you just got to make sure that you get the actual documents, you know, that you review them and make sure that they're actually up to date. Because if this listing agent sends you a bunch of stuff and then you pass it on to the buyer, telling the buyer, here are the condo docs, and the buyer signs the receipt and the three-day right of rescission starts, and it turns out that these documents were out of date, um, then um, and they move in and they want to rent it out and they can't rent it anymore, um, we're going to have a problem, you know, and uh, guess what? You and I and the listing broker and the listing agent all will end up getting sued because we provided uh, invalid information. So it's... Uh, um, I found, you know, I love this industry and I love realtors and I love working with them, but I, I found, unfortunately, that the vast majority of real estate professionals are very lazy. They go the path of least resistance and, um, and you don't want to be that kind of agent and it's that kind of thing that will cause problems. And remember, when we get sued, it's going to be for a lot of money, you know, it's not going to be like some $50 department store refund or something. You know, it's going to be somebody who spent three, four hundred thousand dollars on the property thinking that they got one thing and it turns out they really got another. And uh, the reason that they weren't aware of that is because uh, we misled them by telling them things or sending them outdated documentation and so forth. You know? So very, very important. Um, any questions from any of you before we close this? Um, with the condo issue, I, I, there's always a property manager involved with the condo board, and you can that's they have the most up to date information. <clears throat> In Sarasota, Ar Argus Management handles about 60 of the, of the condo associations in Sarasota. I, I, you can go online and get all the current information there. Yeah, I don't, so I think the other says you know, Reggie up in Tampa, they, all these places have usually a property manager that dominates that marketplace. So that's, that's where I get my things from. And it's, it's a good point. You know, the challenge sometimes is that uh, the, um, it's the obligation of the seller to provide these documents, but the seller or the listing agent don't want to spend the money to get a, a set of condo documents, you know. And, uh, and that's why they keep recirculating all of the, uh, the old documents. And what I used to do as a, as a uh, rule of thumb for myself, when I worked as a listing agent, if I took a listing for a condominium, I obtained a copy of all of the condo docs and application form of application needed to be made at the time I took the listing, you know. So then I had all that stuff. When somebody uh, was ready to make an offer, I could provide them with that, with that information, you know. Um, by the way, there is a, there, on the condo writer, there's an option where the buyer can check off that they already received the condo docs. But read that very careful because the buyer is waiving uh, their three-day right of rescission because they're stating that they received all the documents three days prior to making the offer, you know. So unless they actually receive it three days prior, don't just check that box. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's what I would do. And likewise with the HOAs, Glenda, for example, she's very diligent about that um, in that um, she went overly overboard. She, she, she went and got the uh, HOA uh, documents and then uh, uploaded them and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I would do that as a buyer agent. I wouldn't do that as a listing agent, you know, because it's not your obligation as a listing agent, unlike on this on the on the seller side. But if you wanted to do it, you could, you know, if you want to be over diligent, um, go ahead and get the documents, have them on file. I wouldn't put them into the MLS, but I would just have them on file. So if somebody really asks for them, you have them, you know. Um, but on the condominium, definitely, you want to be proactive and get all that information out there, you know. So, especially, you got that three-day right of rescission. You know, if you're a seller and you got a contract now and it's an executed contract, remember, the buyer has three days right of rescission. And if you're going to dilly-dally around and drag your feet, it's going to be a week until you actually get the documents to the buyer. Then the buyer has all of that time plus another three days to walk away from the deal, you know. I never want that to happen. I mean, I want to make sure that that right of rescission is kept as tight as possible. And, uh, and the best way to do that is to have the documents already in hand, you know. All right, any other questions? Glenda, any thoughts from your end?
I hear you. I'm just muted, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What was the uh, what was the other ride, the Minion Rider? You said there's two documents, is it um, like the HOA and, and a, a rider? What was the other one? No, it's it's the it's the condominium rider. So you have you have the, you have the condominium property disclosure form, which you know a lot of agents think that that is the condominium rider because it talks about the condominium uh, dues and all that wonderful stuff. Um, but the condominium rider is much more specific. In the condominium rider, it addre addresses right of first refusal. Uh, it addresses whether or not the buyer already received the documents three days prior. It spells out what those documents are. And it specifically um, has a box for the buyer to check where the buyer is specifically requesting these documents. Okay, Because the, the way the statutes are written is that the uh, Buyer's three-day right of rescission implies that the buyer requests the documents, and here are the documents that are requested. Uh, the buyer can also waive the uh, request of documents. You know, so there, there's another option on that right. The buyer could just check a different box and says, "I waive the right to request these documents. I don't care. You know, I got, I know the condo. And my mother owned one there forever. You know, so the writer is just much more specified and addresses all the different options uh, with respect to the condo. Thank you. Right. Now, does anyone know what the rescission rate, uh, period is on a brand new condo? I couldn't hear you. <clears throat> does anyone know what the right of rescission is on a new condominium? Is it a month? Three days. Um, seven days. <laughs> <laughs> It used to be 14 days, I believe it's seven days now. Um, and so it's different from, uh, from, a, um, from a, uh, a, a resale condo. The nice thing about a brand new condominium is that they actually give you a binder with all of the documents, you know. <laughs> so they don't, they don't screw around with that. Um, any other questions for anyone? No? No, that was uh, a good Rick, overview. Go Thank you. Go for it, Ricky. Rick is unmuting himself. Damn technology. There we go. That was very good. I, uh, I I did learn some some things. It was a good refreshment. Thank you. You know, the, the details are so important, and everybody does it. Seems like almost everybody does it incorrectly, and uh, they're shocked when uh, you do it the right way. I've never seen that done before. Us the right way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one big challenge is that when you get your real estate license, um, you don't even go over the contract. You know. So agents are kind of thrown into the, the, the batch and, and trained by other agents that were trained the same way. Uh, and so they're just looking at the highlights, you know, the price, the deposit, maybe the financing and everything else and who pays for title. You know, that seems to be like the only thing that they look at. Everything else gets glossed over. And then, you know, every year, two years, the contracts get updated and key uh, changes happen. And even though you have uh, attorneys and title companies put on trainings, to educate agents on that, you know, I mean, in our market where we got 6,200 agents, you got maybe 100 agents going to these trainings, you know, so that will tell you something. That means that 6,100 agents, that they, they, you know, they don't care, they're whatever, you know, they just do things um, the, the way they've been doing them forever. So uh, I think, you know, as professionals, we owe it to our customers um, to somewhat know what we're doing. And, uh, and be familiar with these things and, 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 and have attention to detail. And uh, sometimes, I mean, very experienced agents like, uh, like Jim, you know, they email me and ask me for some questions or I'll, I'll, I'll help them with that. I mean, my job is to uh, help you and keep you and the company out of trouble, you know. And uh, believe me, it's a lot easier to get it done properly up front than having me reject the document. And then you having to go back to the buyer or seller after everything has already been executed to redo things because, you know, 
either the other side was sloppy and you didn't catch it, or you were sloppy and and the other side didn't care. You know, so good, good, good comment. Uh, right. Okay, I will. Unless anyone else has any questions or thoughts, I'm going to uh, wrap this up now. And uh, want to thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, I'll shoot out a message uh, to you guys um, with uh, next week's um, uh, session. I put a note on uh, workplace with respect to you know what kind of training stuff would you guys like to see, and just you know uh, put your comments and your notes on there if there's some specific things um, that you want to see happen. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, and, and great meeting you, Dave. Welcome aboard.